they still exist, the real sports tours. Kawasaki even has two of them in its range. We were out and about in Switzerland today and tested the Ninja 1000 SX and the Ninja H2 SX SE for you. We put the pedal to the metal with supercharged power, but the motto was to ride, not race. So regarding the naming and also the latest updates that the two models have gotten from Kawasaki, a quick explanation. The Ninja 1000 SX, as it stands here, last received a major update in 2020. It came with the ride by wire, the various riding modes, the color display, the cruise control and the quick shifter as standard. So that was the last major update here. The Z had already disappeared from the name a bit earlier. Now, as I said, the Ninja 1000 SX and the Ninja H2. The Ninja H2 SX SE Plus, as it was previously called, has now virtually transferred its features to the standard SE. This means that we have the standard SE with the radar system inside, the adaptive cruise control, and of course all the other gadgets, such as the pretty Brembos, Stylema calipers, the cornering lights, the quick shifter, and so on, which are also included here. All that is also included here. Only this Plus is no longer in the range, and this is now, as I said, the standard SE. So that's the explanation. Let's take a direct look at the differences and similarities between the two models. As already mentioned in the intro, we have two sport touring models here, but if you take a closer look, they are quite different. But before we get into the differences and of course the riding impressions where I'll also ask my colleague Philip to join me, let's start with what the bikes have in common. For example, we have the same seat height of 835 millimeters. We have the same fuel tank capacity of 19 liters. We have the same tires. Of course, that, that's also super cool for us. Both come with the Bridgestone S22 as standard and that was of course a perfect comparison for us. And this S22 right at the beginning is so good because it's simply a super harmonious neutral tire and of course it offers endless grip. And that of course contributed a little to the riding pleasure we were able to experience here. Well, yes, both of them also have electronic, uh, really comprehensive uh, uh, features inside. Both have a color display. Here on the 1000SX, it's a 4.3 inch display. Over here on the compressor rocket, of course, it's a bit bigger. There we have 6.5 inches and both also have, as I said, lean angle dependent sensors on an IMU basis. Uh, this means that we have cornering ABS and lean angle dependent traction control. Both also come with a quick shifter as standard and they are both available in the touring version. This means that Kawasaki always offers the naked bike and then a touring package. And this touring package includes, for example, the rear panniers, the luggage option, and on the 1000 SX, for example, the larger windshield. Both luggage cases also have inside pockets. And yes, from my point of view, this is really something useful that you need on such a sport touring bike. And on this 1000SX, the touring package also includes the heated grips as a special feature. This is already included as standard on the supercharged H2 SX SE. Uh, and that's how I've um, roughly sketched it out. In terms of power, there is of course a bit more. And of course, there are also differences. In, in the 1000SX, there's no supercharger. We have the classic four-cylinder, which has been part of the Kawasaki range for many, many years, originally from the Z1000. It's a 1043cc four-cylinder that sends 142 horsepower to the rear wheel. And this is accompanied by a really powerful 111 newton meters, which are available at around 8,000 RPM and the running smoothness of the bike is very good. It really is the very best. The engine is completely unfamiliar with load changes. Throttle application is super smooth and you can really go through the peaks in second or third gear. You then step on the gas again. It revs up without any chopping on the chain or anything else. So it really is a great pleasure. Uh, the and adrenaline really kick that comes yeah, naturally with the AH2 SXSC. The fact is that uh, these 200 horsepower from the supercharger engine really push you forward. Um, and of course, there's also a bit more in terms of torque. 
it's 137 newton meters and that, that's really something uh, so for someone who has never tried it before it's a really great experience and i'm delighted that kawasaki is putting something like this on the road as standard and that it can actually be bought and experienced by anyone who has the necessary money and yes, we have experienced a lot. And at this point, I would like to bring my colleague Philip into the picture. Philip. Hello, master. Hello, everyone. Hello. Philip, let's start with a question. We had to struggle a bit in Switzerland to try to keep to 80 kilometers per hour on the country road and only 120 on the highway. Not so easy with these very, shall I say, potent bikes, but we still had fun, didn't we? Yes, absolutely. It rides really well. And we discussed it a bit at the beginning. The subject of sport touring motorcycles isn't at the top of my list right now. But I thought about it again today as soon as I got on the bike. It's really cool and really fun. Absolutely. I've often pushed it aside in theory, but when I'm in the saddle, I think to myself, well, that's quite something. Let's maybe go straight into the Ninja 1000 SX with the riding impressions. That was the bike that you grabbed directly this morning and rode off on it. Now the Ninja name is a real holy grail among sports motorcycle connoisseurs and especially among Kawasaki fans. Do you think it's justified? Yes. Um, no, I have to be honest and say no, because for me, Ninja is always the link to super sport, uh, to high end super sport. And it's not a high end sports bike for me. That's more true over there if only because of the seating position, I have to say that I'm confused by the fact that it says Ninja on it. I say that straight up. Of course, I've, I've asked Kawasaki this question before and they told me that Ninja is included in the name if it simply meets a sporty standard and if it simply has high quality features and if you can say with a clear conscience that this is a Kawasaki sports motorcycle. And I already had the impression after riding it today that firstly, the engine of course works bombastically, but also the rest, for example, the brakes, the electronics, that it all makes a really, really super solid sporty impression. And I really had to make an effort to find a fly in the ointment somewhere because yes, it was a real do it all machine for me. Absolutely. So it's an absolute all-rounder. And for me, the bike, you can tell it's a naked bike. The basis is a naked bike, the old Z1000. Um, and it has been made more suitable for touring and of course, sportily sharpened. And you can feel the bike. It rides well. It rides sportily. Absolutely. But still for me personally, but beware, I'm not the biggest super sport fan. I have to be honest. The word ninja, I understand it from a marketing point of view. I also understand the justification due to the sportiness is already there, but I would still simply leave that to the super sports or pure sports bikes. And in this, it is sport touring coming from a naked bike. Accordingly, it also rides more like a naked bike than a sports bike, like a sporty naked bike, but it's not a hyper naked bike and it's not a sports bike either. That's why for me personally, sorry Kawasaki guys, the word ninja is not the best choice here. I say that quite openly. You really liked the engine, didn't you? Uh, what you told me uh, off camera before, so the engine, your opinion on it. Absolutely. So the engine is super smooth on the throttle, no matter what gear you're in. It's almost automatic, extremely smooth, no vibrations, responds well to the throttle, can be controlled wonderfully and has that nice mid-range punch. You can build a four-cylinder engine in such a way that it has punch in the middle and also at the beginning and that's what it has here and it's great to drive. No, no, you can build a four-cylinder engine in such a way that it has punch in the middle and also at the beginning and that's what it has here and it's great to drive. Who needs top-end power on the highway? Nobody, what's important is torque. Yes, and in terms of motorization, however, we of course had a superlative even more with us on our test. Uh, Philip, come over to me so that I can take a look at the beautiful compressor H2SX, your impression of it. Have you ever actually ridden a compressor engine before? Yes, I've ridden one before. So when the bike came out, I rode it once, I really hit the gas on the highway, um, but it was just insane for me, the way it sends it. And I also love that supercharger chirping and whistling when it's revving, it's really cool. That's another reason why I think supercharged bikes are kind of cool. It's something different, it's a unique selling point, and it's nice that it still exists. It's absurd on the one hand, because of course it has incredible power when it whistles in, but it's predictable and that's nice. You can get that power, of course, with the help of the electronics and with the good tires and the good suspension. You can get it on the road. You don't have to be afraid. It has 200 horsepower, which means it's already scary on paper, but you don't need to be afraid in the saddle. Not at all. 
you might only be scared then when it gets really sporty on corner entry because what I noticed, the two bikes, I don't think I've given you the weight data yet. The difference is a massive 32 kilograms. So the supercharger bike with the tubular steel frame, it's also longer in terms of wheelbase. It's got more fairing on it. It quite simply puts 32 kilograms more on the scales. And my impression was already that you can feel that a bit on corner entry. Absolutely, absolutely. So we rode back and forth there as well. And I must confess, I felt much more comfortable on the 1000 SX on the corner entry because it was more that naked bike feeling. Here you have a bit of a sporty character, also in terms of the riding position, except that you are much heavier, and that accelerates at the entrance to the corner. The brakes are now also a little softer in terms of response than on the 1000 SX. This means that you ideally get to the corner faster because you have turned up a bit more beforehand, and then you have to decelerate more weight with slightly softer brakes. That's a bit of an aha experience at first in direct comparison. Not dangerous, not at all, but you definitely notice the 32 kilograms. Uh, you have to get used to it a bit. I'd like to move on to the suspension, but you've just mentioned the brakes, which is also a very important point because, dear people, look here. I mean, the finest Brembo Stilema brakes on a 320 double disc, so that's basically super sport level, while the Ninja 1000 SX only has a 300 millimeter disc on it and also without steel flex lines and so on. That's not on there. That's on there. Unfortunately, it doesn't have it, but the braking performance is just really good. And I have to say, even with less powerful or supposedly less powerful hardware, you almost like it better on the Ninja 1000 SX. Philip also mentioned it, the braking feel, a bit crunchy here, but it's just like that. For example, we also have the radar system in here with the distance cruise control, and this radar system can also independently pass on a certain amount of braking power to the front, so to speak. But it's still the case that there's simply one more module in there, and I think the more modules, the longer the cables are, the less transparent it becomes for the rider. Because, as I said, it can't be down to the hardware and the bike is brand new, so I'm quite sure that it's all the finest, but the comparison is simply merciless. And you have to say, firstly, less weight, and secondly, somehow the more aggressive feel of the brakes. So that's where it wins the rating for me. Philip, but I actually wanted to talk about the suspension because I really liked it on the H2, the electronic skyhook um, suspension. I rode through the towns uh, with you right at the beginning and thought to myself, there's no such thing. Do the Swiss make such perfect roads? Not a single gully cover, not a single bump. I really hardly felt a thing. It's just comfortable uh, to the point of no return. And that really fascinated me. Yes, so in direct comparison, you can just feel it. Electronic suspensions simply feel like they have a different reserve. And I'm afraid I have to make a car comparison again, but that's just the way it is. You glide like in an S-Class, you glide, you ride, and you get a feeling of the road but it's this gliding feeling. Because unlike the 1000SX, it's still classic normal suspension, fully adjustable, but you just feel the suspension more directly. You don't have that gliding character, you just feel everything, it's more wobbly. Um, although here too, that's at a very high height, everything is simply controlled. And I also drove in sport mode beforehand, which is actually a little bit, um, I would say harder or a little bit sharper. Turning in also feels a bit different. I wouldn't necessarily say more harmonious. I think it turns in more harmoniously in road mode, but that's just when you sit on it and say, I'm going to ride my 500 kilometers today, the butt certainly doesn't hurt afterwards. So it doesn't matter even if you send it hard when you're riding it comfortably. It's just super comfortable, but without being spongy or rocky, as you once mentioned, it has its precision and that's already, it's well done. You can't say anything bad about it. I agree. The electronic suspension is absolutely top-notch. It works really, really well. And in sport mode, it becomes a bit more robust. It becomes a bit, uh, yes, a bit more uh, stiff perhaps. But yes, for me, it was just a really great experience, a real aha effect, especially in direct comparison. How it irons things out. Kawasaki itself speaks of a skyhook suspension which means that the bike stays at high RPMs and the suspension at low revs works it away, so to speak. This is also known from the automotive scene where it is common practice, but the fact is it worked really well and I give it a thumbs up for that. Philip, let's perhaps go into a little more detail about the Ninja 1000 SX. Of course, we have a more aggressive geometry, a shorter wheelbase, 
a classic aluminum frame which was already visible in a similar form on the Z1000. And of course the seating position and ergonomics, which is the topic I want to talk about now, are completely different. I have a really great sport there. The front is well under control. I really have a lot of weight on it. And on the Ninja 1000, I thought to myself, this is actually the better touring enduro bike. For those who only ride on the road, it's basically the same range of functions as a touring enduro bike, but simply offers a better feel for the front. And the 17 inch wheel is of course ideal. Can you make such a comparison? Would you, for example, prefer this to a touring enduro bike in your practice? Absolutely. Uh, I have to explain something to you very briefly. Uh, well, I think that a lot of people out there basically choose a bike based on the wrong parameters, namely its looks or what their friends ride and not so much on what my needs are and how I actually use it. Everyone rides touring enduro bikes because they're great, they don't cover much, it's the SUV, the bike. But when I look at how many people probably ride a Z1000, and ride a lot of kilometers and maybe with two people and maybe with luggage, it's not like that. That's the perfect choice then. I don't need a naked bike. I take this little bit of wind protection with me. I take the better luggage solution. I actually sit similarly to a naked bike, very similarly. It actually rides very similarly to a naked bike, except that I have a bit more comfort so that I can put in more kilometers. Um, a bit of a longer gear ratio to now maybe make, make the, the comparison against Z1000 there as well. A longer final drive ratio, which means I can probably save a bit of fuel when touring at lower speeds. Um, and the handlebars are a bit narrower. Um, maybe we'll go back over there for a bit, move around a bit. I've got two ends on there, two halves, so to speak. And it's a bit narrower. And it seems to me that if you're really sporty in the radius, you can also take your body along a bit and still not cause any unrest. In other words, it really is the perfect solution for drawing a precise line from my point of view. And yet it's incredibly easy and intuitive, this turning momentum. So from the neutral position into the radius, but we also had an interesting experience with the dual carriageway and then sometimes a bit worse sections of road. Philip, would you like to tell us? Yes, you drove ahead with the H2. I followed on the 1000 SX and you rode over the Bidamen and I thought to myself, dude, can't you see the Bidamen and it didn't move with you? And then I caught two or three Bidamen in a row and it shifted me a few centimeters so that you had this little wobble in there. And then I changed it afterwards. And it really is like that. You just have this slightly more agile geometry on the 1000 SX, which tends to wobble a little more when you're riding than when you're riding the H2. You are simply more stable. You have a better feeling for the front tire because you are naturally leaning over it more. And that makes a difference that you probably wouldn't even notice unless you were making a direct change. I also felt the same way when I saw the bikes on paper in the catalog online or in the showrooms. They are very, very similar. But when you sit on it, it's just the addition. In terms of ergonomics, they are very different bikes. And when you ride them, you realize that they have very different basic characters. I got a naked bike that's suitable for touring, and I've got a sport tourer, which for me is a classic sport tourer based on a sport motorcycle made more suitable for touring. You might have wanted to give me a very brief live seat test. Would you like to get on for a moment so that I can see how you sit on it? I had the impression that the knee angle is also a bit more relaxed. Uh, as I mentioned, the seat height itself is the same at 835 millimeters. But maybe it just seems that way because the upper body position is much more upright and you sit really relaxed on it. But I would also like to take this opportunity to ask you another question. Philip? How did you get on with the windshield? Very good. So on both, you mentioned it. On the compressor, we have a fantastic windscreen. That's actually the case. I tried it out when you make yourself tiny. At some point, you no longer feel any headwind at all. And it's actually very good here too. And for me, it is and remains more of a naked bike in terms of its basic characteristics. You sit so well on it. So I can ride tens of kilometers on it at 185 meters without any problems, without thinking I'm going to get a headache or anything. Philip is uh, 1.85 meter tall, I'm 1.90 tall, and then I also tried to play around a bit. Philip, can I ask you to move the windshield, uh, move it upwards then with the angle? Um, I have a locking button here in the cockpit, and then I can adjust the angle. But I have to say, I was a mad fan of the fact that when you put it back down, you actually leave it in the lowest position so that you take your upper body perfectly out of the wind up to above your chest, just below your neck. But the helmet is still neutral without any turbulence in the wind. I was really totally happy with it and thought to myself, that's good. 
but it was also good, as you've just mentioned, Philip, when you sit on the H2SX. So I would ask you to maybe take a seat there for a moment and then make yourself really small so that your head fits exactly under the windshield. There you are, theoretically, driving down the highway in a hurricane inside. Then you duck down and it's quiet. All you hear is the sound of the engine pulling up. You're perfectly out of the wind, of course, with the wider front section and the wide side panels. The feeling is somehow unique, isn't it? When you squeeze into it like that, it's quite a feeling, isn't it? Yeah, well, I tested it out on the highway back then too. It's pretty intense, um, so you can hide from the wind. I have to say in general, I've noticed that a few times in the last few years. I think the dynamics are quite good out there. Even on the Versus 1000 back then, it had this opening in the windshield and I thought to myself, what's the point of having an opening in there? But it was just really pleasant to ride. It was also relatively quiet. And I have the feeling that they have some good engineers at the moment who have simply thought about how to solve this ideally without it looking like shit. Because everything looks totally harmonious and integrated. Um, and besides, it fits normal tall Central Europeans at one 80 meter up to my height with one 190 meters. I absolutely agree. And fun fact, the case system is also perfectly integrated and believe it or not is approved for speeds of up to 299 km per hour. Many of the people watching may be familiar with the fact that if you fit such an accessory case system, there's a big sticker inside saying 130 km per hour maximum. Kawasaki doesn't give a damn about that, so they've probably fixed it quite powerfully and integrated it perfectly aerodynamically. And with it, you can cruise along at 300 km per hour on the highway. So that's quite a thing. But only in Germany. In Germany, of course. We didn't, we didn't do that here in Switzerland. Of course, that would have been fatal. But in Germany, if you say you want to, or maybe you're going on a trip somewhere up to the North Sea in Switzerland or towards Hamburg, or I don't know, and you can really go there at 300 km per hour on some of the routes. <laughs> And that's also fascinating, of course. So on the one hand, of course, to be able to drive it with this supercharger power and then really be able to handle this speed with a clear conscience. I have to bring something into this now because I've just seen it in the mirror. As always, we've ridden one behind the other. And the nice thing is it has a blind spot assist system and I could see exactly whether I was positioned correctly for group driving. Because you can see from behind whether it's on or not. In other words, I recognized exactly whether I was in the perfect position in relation to you. It's displayed to you as a blind spot, but of course you can see me perfectly because I can also see your helmet. And that's quite funny for riding in a group because you can really tell from the little orange, the little triangle, whether the person in front is right or wrong. It's actually really good practice for road training. So you had a good amount of time behind me. Uh, apparently I was very slow at this point. I'd like to talk a little bit about the cockpit now also in comparison. Um, uh, the instruments here on the H2 um, are, of course, the very best, uh, both hydraulic, of course, so the clutch is also fully adjustable with radial adjustment from the Nissan adjustable lever width. Perfect. The Brembo brakes are, of course, also beyond any doubt. And basically, this Kawasaki button system, which may not be the most intuitive at first glance for someone who hasn't tried it yet, but if you click through it a bit, you'll get the idea relatively quickly. And we can also take a look at this button system, which is simply identical here on the Ninja 1000 SX. In other words, once you've got to know your way around it, it fits and you can manage it. And this heated grips are also super easy to operate with a button next to it. And here too, it has to be said that uh, the clutch is now a classic cable clutch, not at this very highest level, let's say with hydraulics, but the lever is also adjustable. Both levers are also available in black. I always find it appealing when the bright stainless steel isn't flashing and reflecting. It's simply a really high quality solution. And in general, Philip, you are such a connoisseur when it comes to workmanship, body panels, looks and paintwork. Yes. I always get the reputation from you guys that I'm so picky at a thousand PS. No, but it's true. I wanted to add that the workmanship is really good. They don't bother each other for that, do they? No, so they're both at a great level. This flake paint alone, the fact that it still shimmers so beautifully, this metallic, it's simply well done. And as you rightly said, fine color nuances. There's no flashes of silver or ochre. It's all in one piece. It's beautifully done. But I have to say, I still expect that from a bike in this price range. It's so beautiful here that you just say, okay, the Kawasaki logo is so eye-catching and everything is nicely coordinated. In terms of quality, so to speak, it is absolutely fitting and appropriate for the price. And I'm sure there are one or two manufacturers out there who can't do it at the same level. And keyword price, of course, 
also quite essential because I'm convinced uh, now that we've chatted quite a lot, people also want to know what they cost. We have the prices for all three countries, Germany, Austria and Switzerland uh, in the 1000 PS marketplace in the video description linked. And the price difference if you then take the Swiss prices is a Z900 SE 12,900 francs is the difference between the two bikes. That's enough to fit an entire mid-range naked bike. And that is, of course, quite a lot. I mean, Philip, what would you say now? Of course, features, components, electronic suspension, uh, this uh, adaptive cruise control with the radar system. Uh, you can't deny that. There really is a lot of good stuff in there. Um, but, but from your point of view, is it really worth the extra cost in practice? If I want a supercharged bike and I want to put a lot of miles on it, then I think people will be over it because they'll say, I want the supercharger. I want maximum sport touring characteristics, then I'll just buy it. I don't think that's a major barrier. I think we're in a league where people say, if I want something, I'll buy it. And then it doesn't really matter whether it costs 2,000, 3,000 euros or francs more or less. For me personally, I have to say quite clearly with these two bikes, even if I don't use them, taking the price into account, the 1000SX is clearly the better choice for me in terms of value for money because I have the option of customizing the suspension if I want to, for example. And uh, apart from that, these bikes have everything I need for sport touring. Uh, I don't necessarily need the radar system. Personally, it's a cool feature. It's also a safety feature, especially on the highway when you're doing a lot of miles and maybe you're not quite as alert in your head. But I also have the option of using the radar system here. I also have cruise control on here, so that's even more important to me than the radar. It's fine. I like it. It might also be interesting to have a few key data that focus specifically on this touring topic. Uh, we haven't mentioned payload yet. Um, so the payload is identical for both vehicles, 195 kilograms, quite a lot. So I'd say that's good enough to really go touring with two people, maybe two people with light luggage for touring. In any case, I'd say that's perfectly fine. And when it comes to consumption, I've also done a bit of research. I think you can really ride the 1000 SX with 5 liters or even under 5 liters if you try your best. We did get it up to 6.2 liters, but basically around 5 liters is realistic. And my feeling with the H2 SX when I looked in the cockpit was that it was always a liter more. So you're always around 6 liters or more. But of course, the compressor is appealing. You can also cruise through town in 5th or 6th gear and just nod along. But at some point, when you've already got the power, you want to use it, don't you? Yeah, and my dad always says a little goes a long way. That's just the way it is. You have a lot of power here and when you fire it off, then I mean, it needs a bit more fuel. And quite honestly, if I buy a bike like this and I have the money, does it matter to me whether it's one liter more or less? I hope not, because if that's the deciding factor, I don't think you're really in the right place anyway. What's perhaps also exciting in terms of the touring focus in Switzerland, there's basically only the H2 SX SE and the normal one doesn't exist at all. So while you can still buy the normal SX in Germany and Austria, only the SE version is available there. And of course, it also has many fine accessories that have a special touring focus. For example, it comes with cornering lights as standard, this means that when I turn into a bend, uh, depending on the lean angle, the additional headlights are activated, which is, of course, not bad. I saw that. When I was driving in front of you, I kept asking myself for a moment, what's that back there? And then I checked, ah, that's the cornering lights. And I think especially for people who really push themselves to the limit on the bike, in the saddle, there's a certain safety factor for the evening. And yes, we've already mentioned the features, the blind spot assist, the radar system, the electronic suspension. All these goodies that are now included are also standard, but you also pay for them. So 27,990 Swiss francs is, of course, a big deal. You don't need to talk about it, but you get a lot for the money. And you also get some optical gimmicks, such as the fine single swing arm at the rear. And then there's the rim with a polished ring around it. So yes, you simply notice that the red pencil was not necessarily used very strictly in the design. Instead, they said, no, we simply want to achieve a premium. And we really want to make the best with the best ingredients available to people here. Yes, and Philip, now I'll take another look. Have we forgotten anything essential? Can you think of anything else that should be mentioned? Or are we done with our comparison so far? Because of course, I still need your favorite. No, so for me, we're actually done so far. I think it's important to test drive it if you're undecided because the rider experience is completely different. Um, it might not look like that in the brochure. It doesn't look like that in the showroom when you're just standing next to it. But the moment you sit on it and ride it, you can feel the differences very quickly. 
I think two or three turns are enough and then you've got it. Um, I've already revealed a bit about my favorite, which is the 1000 SX behind me here. For me, coming from the naked bike track, it's the slightly more accessible bike. The price factor also plays a role, but I understand everyone who says they want a supercharger. So they buy the H2, what's it called again? SXSE, the H2 SXSE, because of course it's simply a killer package. Um, I have to say, leaving the price aside, I think the H2 SXSE is very, very fascinating, um, but not so much because of the compressor, which I also find incredibly powerful, but the overall package, this incredible precision, this unshakable handling, the suspension that really irons everything away, that simply has something going for it. And the overall package is wonderfully balanced for me. Although of course, many, many buyers and customers are probably really well served with it for not half, but for almost half the money, it has to be said. And they, they are both beautiful and they are both fun and in that respect, I think we will now come to an end. I hope we were able to inspire you a little. Maybe you were able to take one or two things with you from our article. Please let us know. Write us in the comments below. What we are always happy about, not only Philip and I, but also the whole 1000 PS crew is a thumbs up from you under the video. And with these words, now all the love home here from Switzerland. See you soon. Ciao.